Okay. Um, I have received notice from the Minister of Justice that she wishes to make a statement. And before I call the Minister, uh, can I remind members that, in light of social distancing being observed by the parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make their name, make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called. But they can do this by rising in their places as well as notifying the business office or the speaker's table directly. I remind members to be concise, please, in asking their questions. Uh, I would also remind members that in accordance with long established procedure, points of order will not be normally taken during the statement or the question period thereafter. I call on the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with permission, I wish to make a statement regarding a bilateral meeting under the auspices of the Intergovernmental Agreement on Cooperation on Criminal Justice Matters, held virtually on Friday, the 27th of November, 2020. This was my first such meeting with Helen McEntee, TD, the Minister of Justice, at which I represented the Executive. I intend to continue the practice introduced by former Justice Minister David Ford of making periodic statements to keep this Assembly informed of meeting held, meetings held under the auspices of the agreement. The Intergovernmental Agreement on Cooperation on Criminal Justice Matters provides the framework for North-South cooperation in this area. It provides for meetings between the Justice Ministers North and South. Such engagement is very important. To a large extent, we share the same justice problems, issues and concerns. This was the first IGA ministerial meeting to have taken place since November 2016. This long gap came about as a consequence of the period of the Assembly's inactivity and the recent Irish general elections. The re-establishment of the ministerial meetings is particularly timely given the known impacts the coronavirus pandemic has had on justice systems and the as yet unknown consequences that will flow from Brexit. It's an extremely useful forum to maintain relationships with our counterparts in Ireland across a wide range of justice issues. The IGA joint work provides a focus for the work of joint work on justice issues related to the management of offenders, the support for victims, uh, knowledge and exchange between our forensic services, uh, engagement on youth justice developments and policing of diverse communities. Five Point Project advisory groups uh, have been providing the mechanism by which the work in each of these areas is taken forward. In spite of the hiatus in the publication of a work programme, Minister McEntee and I were impressed by the progress that has been made in these areas since the last IGA meeting. A work programme is normally prepared and published annually under the auspices of the IGA. This requires ministerial sign-off, and I am pleased to announce today that a new work programme has been prepared under the terms of the IGA for 2020-21. This was signed off jointly by me and Minister McEntee at the IGA ministerial meeting. I have spoken often about the importance of working together across the justice system, the executive and the voluntary community sector to implement the recommendations of the Gillen Report in a way that delivers the reform envisaged. I therefore particularly welcome the opportunity at the IGA meeting to share the progress that we are making against implementation of the Gillen Review, highlighting some of the current key initiatives that will help to transform and improve the experience of victims and witnesses. These initiatives include the introduction of the Committal Reform Bill to this Assembly on 3 November, which will help to reduce delay and the time taken to deal with serious sexual offences cases by removing the use of oral evidence as part of the committal process. It will also avoid vulnerable victims having to give oral evidence and be cross-examined more than once in the process. In addition, the Bill will also introduce new arrangements whereby relevant cases can bypass the committal process entirely, thus ensuring those cases are transferred to the Crown Court at an earlier stage. I also updated Minister McEntee on the establishment of a new pilot scheme that will provide publicly funded, independent legal advice to adult complainants in serious sexual offence cases. The service will be available from the point that a crime is reported up until the commencement of the trial. I recognise that the criminal justice processes themselves can be traumatic for complainants in these cases. I am confident that this new initiative, which should be operational by the 1st of April next year, will help to support complainants as their cases progress and increase their confidence in the criminal justice system. We also discussed work my department is taking forward on providing remote evidence facilities in Belfast and Craigavon. I expect these facilities to be operational within weeks, enabling vulnerable adult and child victims and witnesses to provide their evidence to the court remotely. This is an important step forward, which will again improve the experience of complainants and vulnerable witnesses. It will minimise the likelihood of them being re-traumatised by having to meet the accused or give evidence in a daunting courtroom environment, 
at what is undoubtedly a traumatic and distressing time in their lives. Minister McEntee and I agreed on continuing collaboration and a work programme at official level aimed at promoting shared learning in respect of support for victims. So many of the issues and challenges relating to victims and witnesses are mirrored across our two jurisdictions. In each jurisdiction, we face challenges around supporting victims and witnesses within the criminal justice system, around providing timely and accurate information to victims relevant to their case, and around ensuring that victims and witnesses are consistently able to access their entitlements under their respective charters. There is clearly much merit in continued cross-border cooperation on these issues, and I welcome the ongoing commitment to close cooperation through the Support for Victims Programme Advisory Group. We also discussed the impact of domestic violence and the exacerbation of incidents of domestic violence that have arisen during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is something that both ministers and the two police services see as a priority area of work. We expect some further areas of shared work to develop in this area following the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Bill here in Northern Ireland. I've attached a copy of the 2020-21 Work Program, program which was agreed at our meeting on the 27th of November to the printed version of the statement. It will also be published in the relevant departmental websites following this statement. In relation to Brexit, we had an important discussion on the, cha on the challenges faced by justice organisations um, in both jurisdictions. As ministers, we are committed to ensuring that we maintain and build on good cross-border cooperation that already exists as well as sharing standards, practices and procedures in areas such as operational engagement, forensics and data exchange. It is critical that these important areas of joint work can continue as we approach the end of the transition period following exit from the European Union. I also wish to provide members with an update on the Joint Agency Task Force, JAFT, which was instituted under the Fresh Start Agreement and is led by senior officers from the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Garda Shikana, um, the Revenue Commissioners and HM Revenue and Customs. A number of other organisations, including the National Crime Agency and the Irish Criminal Assets Bureau, are also involved in operational activity. This is overseen by a strategic oversight group and an operations coordination group. An initial, prior, an initial six priority areas of action were agreed. These are rural crime, child sexual exploitation, financial crime, illicit drugs, excise fraud, human trafficking. The task force has advanced our cross-border operational response. At the meeting, we received a copy of the latest six-monthly report to the JATF to September 2020. In spite of the coronavirus pandemic, cross-border investigations have continued across a number of crime types, including burglary, armed robbery, hijacking, ATM thefts, livestock thefts and cruelty to animals. Human trafficking remains a concern in both jurisdictions. A number of cross-border investigations remain active, with potential victims having been identified. The PSNI Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit and Angarda Shikana Human Trafficking Investigation and Coordinations Unit recorded 76 persons who have presented during the period as potential victims of human trafficking in Ireland and Northern Ireland. During this reporting period, the coronavirus pandemic has negatively affected organised crime groups in, their, in terms of their illicit production facilities due to international restrictions on the movement of people. However, this is assessed as a temporary effect and illicit production remains a significant threat. There are currently a number of cross-border excise fraud investigations that are being pursued by the authorities on both sides of the border. There are a total of 15 financial crime investigations ongoing under the auspices of the cross-border JATF. The investigations are being conducted by the PSNI and Garda Shikana, CAB and the NCA, supported by HMRC, the Revenue Commissioners, and incorporate a range of criminal offending, including drug trafficking, cigarette smuggling, modern slavery, modern slavery and human trafficking, theft and fraud. In addition to criminal investigation powers, non-conviction-based asset recovery powers are also being utilised in both jurisdictions to disrupt OCGs and recover the proceeds of crime. This reporting period witnessed three large law enforcement agency interventions on both sides of the RAC, resulting in approximately um, 9.7 million euro of drugs being seized. Minister McEntee and I will take receipt of the formal six-month update from the Joint Agency Task Force at our next meeting. Um, and I look forward to be able to report on further success of the task force to this assembly in May. 
In conclusion, I am committed to maintaining our excellent criminal justice cooperation with Ireland between our respective law enforcement agencies. The strong levels of engagement between our respective criminal justice agencies is all the more important as Brexit negotiations reach a conclusion and we begin our exit from the European Union structures. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call Paul Given, the Committee for Justice Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for this statement and coming before the House uh, to provide it. Uh, long before Brexit, uh, there has been a crime bonanza on the border, exploited by criminal organisations, paramilitary organisations, and a lot of these issues uh, the Minister has referred to have, have taken place for many years. In the discussions with her counterpart in the Republic of Ireland, uh, what uh, measures are going to be taken that, uh, post-Brexit, uh, there will be a serious level of engagement to tackle the criminality that has existed for many years at the border? Mr Speaker, um, the Chair of the Committee is of course correct that there has been a history um, of criminality on both sides of the border and I think that is true in almost all um, border communities right across um, the globe because people will work to exploit those differences um, at the interface um, in order to be able to continue um, with their criminal activity. It will be of course a matter um, for the future security partnership if such a security partnership can be agreed in order to ensure that we maintain the kind of streamlined and effective and efficient uh, working that we currently have on a cross-border basis. However, I am reassured that the work that has been done by my department and by the Department um, of Justice um, in the Republic of Ireland um, is building upon the good cooperation and collaboration that we have. And through the Joint Agency Task Force, I think that there is a real opportunity to bring together um, both um, revenue and customs um, interventions as well as criminal justice interventions to ensure that we are able to actively um, and cooperatively deal uh, with cross-border crime. And I call Linda Dillon. Good. Can I thank the Minister for her statement today and appreciate some of the issues outlined. I suppose just for future it might be beneficial for us to get a wee bit more information about what's coming from the other side. So, so what's been said by the Justice Minister in, in the 26 counties in relation to what updates they're giving us. But could the Minister give me some more detail in relation to the new pilot scheme and the legal advice for adult complainants in serious sexual offences, cases including how many complainants might have access to that and where it will be based and how long it will run for? Um, with respect to that, I'm happy to write to the, uh, to the member with further details. In respect of my statement, obviously it is about my engagement with Minister McEntee. She will also be making um, a comparable statement um, to the doll in due course. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, welcome uh, the Minister's uh, positive engagement with her counterpart in the South, and indeed, in particular, the uh, issues around sexual and domestic violence. But I think it's very worrying in the week that's in it and the day that's in it, Mr. Speaker, that we uh, examine a wee bit more closely uh, the operational engagement forensics and data exchange in the absence of the uh, agreements that are uh, going to be lost to us whenever the uh, Britain uh, leaves the EU. So, in terms of the data exchange around forensics, fingerprint, DNA, and indeed the European arrest warrant, you know, I know that there's unpre unprecedented cooperation between the PSN and Garda Síochána, and now the two ministers. So, what gaps and how are they going to be filled in the immediate aftermath of the UK exit? I thank the member for her question. As she will be aware, um, the two main priorities for the Department um, of Justice um, are that we are able to, first of all, um, have an effective and efficient replacement um, for the European arrest warrant, should we not have access to that um, beyond um, our exit from the EU. Um, and the second area, which is a, our priority, is for data adequacy agreements to be sought. Data adequacy agreements have been sought by other countries, particularly in relation to GDPR, and that has a, so there is a, a, an effective way forward on that. But we will be the first to seek a data adequacy agreement when it comes to justice um, measures, and so it is as yet untested territory. However, both departments have worked closely together in order to ensure that we do have mechanisms, effective mechanisms, um, to continue with our cooperation on a legal basis um, in the interim while those things are done. However, it would be our view that 
should there not be a future security partnership agreed as a result of Brexit, it would be important that the Home Office take forward as a matter of urgency bilateral negotiations under the protocol um, with the Irish Government in order to ensure that all of the various justice measures that may be compromised um, by Brexit can then um, be streamlined and improved through a bilateral agreement. And I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for um, her really useful statement. Uh, and, and if I can ask, and, and uh, apologies if I'm swaying into the operational side of things a little bit, but it's really just her, her view on this, uh, if she can't go into any detail. Um, but as you well know, that a lot of the crime that happens uh, across the border uh, is, is paramilitary organised, and that is financial crime, illicit drugs, excise fraud, even human trafficking. Uh, so can I ask the Minister, um, the, the JATF, how do they coordinate with our own paramilitaries task force um, and, and feed into the action plan on paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime? Well, the member makes a very good point, and as he knows, um, in terms of our own um, paramilitary and organised uh, crime task force, um, obviously the PSNI um, are the main coordinating body, and so the work that is done through the JATF um, will also be reflected in terms of paramilitarism more generally. Um, obviously, the Chief Constable would be best placed um, to discuss the operational matters um, in relation to that coordination. However, we also, as the member will be aware, um, we are also doing work in order to enhance our capability when it comes to civil recovery, for example, um, under unexplained wealth order, orders, um, uh, freezing of criminal assets in banks um, and forfeiture orders, because I think all of those will help um, us to uh, fight against organised crime. And as he rightly says, the, the division between organised crime and paramilitarism is often paper thin, if at all. And I call John Blair. I, can I thank the Minister for, for her statement? Uh, Mr Speaker, cross-border cooperation and policing is a crucial matter at all times, of course, but is particularly so in the context of Brexit uncertainties. The, the Statement and Business uh, Plan Work Programme provided today refer to cooperation on uh, operational engagement, forensics and data exchange. Can I ask the Minister if similar cooperation is taking place at local level uh, with, for example, neighbourhood teams and district policing teams? I thank the member for his question, and that is a consideration um, which we actually discussed um, with both um, the Chief Commissioner, Frank Gardner Shikana, um, and also um, the Chief Constable um, of the PSNI. And there is very good um, local cooperation um, between, for example, um, community um, policing teams um, in terms of um, are things that they would be concerned about in terms of community. Um, community crime, tensions, fear of crime, tackling um, issues, local neighbourhood issues and communities, because I think as we all recognise, people, um, particularly border communities, live cross-border lives, and so the things that impact on people on one side of the border will also be impacting on communities on the adjacent side of the border. And so there is good <coughs> ongoing working, and we believe that that will be able to continue um, post-exit from the European Union and the transition period, um, through, largely through the cooperation um, at local level um, between the various policing teams. We've seen that perhaps um, <clears throat> we've seen that perhaps to a greater degree than usual um, in terms of policing around COVID issues and trying to cooperate um, the use of resources there. But I think it is very important um, that we continue with that on the ground cooperation as well as the high level cooperation uh, which we take forward as ministers in terms of our operational planning. Nicole Gordon Dunn. Thank you. Mr Speaker and thank the Minister for her statement today. We do welcome the commitment within the Joint Agency Task Force that tackling human trafficking is one of the six priority cases. There is real concern, however, that there has been a very low number of convictions secured for human trafficking offences, with only nine individuals being persecuted for trafficking offences and only four convictions secured. What more can be done to tackle human trafficking in relation to on a cross-border basis? Well, I think that there are a number of things, first of all, that it would be worth um, acknowledging that the JATF are able to do. And previous reports, for example, have indicated a number of areas where collaborative working has been able um, to give added value. There is increased, avail increased availability of law enforcement to target, intercept and seize um, tangible criminal assets, but also to interrupt and disrupt criminal activity, particularly those that would lead to um, 
that would lead to crime groups having financial incentives for their work, and human trafficking falls within that category because, unfortunately, those involved in human trafficking do not treat people uh, with human dignity, but instead treat them as though they are commodities to be traded. And so I think it's hugely important. There's also been enhanced identification of organised crime groups that work across the border better communication and stronger relationships between law enforcement both north and south, which is also important. And whilst there has been previously strong cross-border links, the ability to run coordinated operations has a particular value, particularly, I think, with issues like organised crime um, and with human trafficking. Opportunities also for enhanced and streamlined information and intelligence sharing and opportunities for joint training, all of which will impact on the issue um, of human trafficking. I think it has to be said, Mr Speaker, that those organisations which are engaged in trafficking um, of, any, of anything at all um, as part of their organised crime networks will use those routes in order to traffic drugs, contraband, cigarettes, whatever it might be, and will use them just as readily um, to traffic individuals. And I think we need to be very conscious of that. So I think even just the work that's done um, at local level in terms of creating more vigilance um, and more awareness in local communities has been hugely important in terms of exposing suspicious activity, which can then be reported on either side of the border and escalated so that it can be looked into. Nicole, Emma Rogan. The Minister has noted um, that both Ministers and the two police services see domestic abuse as a priority area of shared work, um, which is welcome. A particular focus should be on those living, working and residing in the wider border regions. Can the Minister outline today some details of her discussions with Minister McEntee about any joint work that was done to tackle domestic abuse during the recent pandemic? Well, first of all, there was quite a lot of work done on both sides of the border in terms of communication, and I think that that was a key, a key aspect of this, because people will listen um, to the media, um, they will access Twitter, they will access um, social media and also mainstream media um, in much the same way, regardless of where um, on which side of the border they live. So the coordination um, of us being able, for example, to bring forward um, more advertising to raise awareness has also been important. Um, as the member may be aware, um, the Republic of Ireland have also had the O'Malley um, review um, of uh, domestic abuse and vulnerable witnesses, particularly um, in terms of prosecution of sexual offences. So that work would very much mir mirror the work that was done by Gillen around particularly sexual offences. And it has been good for us, for example, to be able to look at areas where we have been piloting certain, um, certain approaches um, to dealing with vulnerable witnesses and then can feed that through to our counterparts in the South. And there are other areas where they are piloting the issues and we are able to learn from their experience. So I think that that kind of cooperation and collaboration, whether it is in relation to domestic abuse or whether it is in relation um, to sexual offences, is something that we need to build on in the coming weeks and months. I think across this island there are people clearly who are living in fear in their own homes, who are subject to domestic abuse and to violence, and we want that to stop. Um, and it's very clear that there is a coordinated effort from both sides of the border um, to ensure that, first of all, we have the right legislative vehicles in order to ensure that abuse um, is captured, but also that we have the right um, coordination when it comes to training, for example, um, of officers who will be dealing with this in the front line. And I think that is another area where cross-border cooperation could be very helpful. Nicole Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for her uh, statement, an uh, extremely useful statement. I, I note, Minister, that the matter of cruelty to animals uh, was discussed um, with your counterpart. Could I ask the Minister if specifically the uh, cruel practice of puppy farming was indeed uh, discussed? Um, I note that the uh, Mid-Ulster PSNI are running a campaign which they have entitled Pause, P-A-W-S, Pause for Thought, in, in this area. And that they're indicating in that campaign that they believe organised crime groups are involved in, indeed, the uh, puppy farming. Can I just ask if, uh, and indeed the PSNI indicate to me that they're concerned about puppy smuggling across the border. If puppy farming was discussed, perhaps the Minister would let us know, and if it wasn't discussed, would she add it to the next agenda? 
Mr. Speaker, it wasn't particularly focused on in this, in this meeting. Um, we did talk, though, more widely um, about animal cruelty and animal welfare, and particularly um, issues around, for example, um, organised crime group involvement um, in either the theft of animals, the smuggling of animals, um, or um, the abuse of animals, um, for example, for things like dog fighting. Um, however, I'm more than happy to add the issue um, of puppy farms and indeed puppy smuggling um, to the list of issues which we talk about because it is clear um, that organised crime groups will diversify into whatever sector they can. And if they have no consideration when it comes to human trafficking, they certainly have no conscience um, when it comes to how they treat animals. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for her statement. And I note and welcome the Department's work on providing remote evidence facilities for vulnerable adults and child victims and witnesses. Would the Minister agree that the Barnhouse model is the gold standard for supporting child victims and witnesses? And can she confirm if there's any work ongoing to introduce such a model here? Um, yes, I'm happy to confirm that we are looking at the Barna House model and it's something that we would like to see introduced um, in line with the recommendations of the Gillen report. We are building, first of all, in terms of the remote evidence centres because that's the first bit that we are going to trial and pilot here. Um, those, that will be done in Craigavon and in Belfast um, initially um, and we will then be able to test um, the effectiveness um, of those operations um, and learn from that, um, from that pilot. Um, and then it would be our intention to look at the wider issues around the Barna House model to see if there are more issues from that that we can bring forward in due course. But I would like to believe that at some point we will be in a situation where we will not have vulnerable victims and witnesses having to give evidence in court at any of our courthouses um, in such uh, sensitive uh, and, 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 and difficult trials. I call Matthew to Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for this update. It is, however, mildly perplexing that with just a couple of weeks until the end of the transition period, Brexit has, has just three short paragraphs in this statement. To that end, and given the importance of the issues outlined uh, uh, in relation to the end of the transition period, can the Minister update us on her reasonable worst-case scenario, one that may have been presented to her by officials, for what happens in terms of cross-border law enforcement if there is not a deal by the end of this year? And secondly, can I invite her to make uh, to set out her position today to people who are still considering that no deal is a good outcome for any part of the United Kingdom. Can I offer her the opportunity now to make her position clear and that of the Northern Ireland Executive to people who are still toying with that idea? Well, I, I thank the member um, for the opportunity to do so. Um, I wouldn't wish people to think because it's three short paragraphs in my statement um, that it didn't um, get sufficient attention at the meeting. I can assure the member it certainly did. Um, there has been a lot of preparatory work done, that's the first thing I want to say, with my own department um, and with the Department for Justice um, in the South. So there's been a lot of preparatory work done in terms of how we can reinforce um, our cooperation, how we can ensure um, that we're able to continue with joint operations and indeed how we can ensure that we're able to continue to share data on a legal footing because, of course, goodwill is not enough um, when it comes to, to Brexit. However, it's clear um, that there would be significant obstacles um, presented to us in terms of both delay um, and cost were we not to have um, a fully agreed future security partnership. And as we know, that future security partnership is, is, in, is um, inextricably linked to having a wider agreement. I have no difficulty in saying that I believe that to leave the European Union without an agreement um, would be an act of folly and recklessness. It would do harm not just to the economy but to the justice system um, and it would, it would inhibit our ability to cooperate. It is important um, for people to recognise that many of the fallback positions which we will take um, as a safety net position when we exit the European Union, if we were to do so without a future security partnership, would leave us reliant on protocols um, and on conventions that were agreed in the 1950s. Um, and I have to say it's difficult to fight uh, 2020 crime uh, with the tools available in the 1950s. Those tools are still operational, they are still effective, um, and they would still be able, for example, to um, allow us to extradite people. But the length of time which it would take to do so would multiply greatly. And we know that one of the key indicators um, that we are looking at trying to address um, in the Department of Justice is to deal with delay in the court system. And it seems to me utterly bizarre that we would introduce potentially an additional two to three years in extradition terms, um, during which time we have to remember that there could be victims and witnesses um, who are waiting um, for trial to take place. So I think on all of those um, scores, we will do our best to work within the structures that are available to us to keep people safe um, and to protect the local community but no one should be under any illusions 
that the loss of capacity that could result um, if we don't get agreements around things like access to the European arrest warrant um, through the Future Security Partnership, access to the databases such as PROM and ECRIS, um, as, as that we would otherwise lose, and indeed, um, if we don't get access to a data adequacy agreement, we'd have a direct um, implication um, for the administration of justice, which would be, I think, mainly in cost terms and in time terms, though we may be able to work at a slower pace um, in some areas. Certainly, um, the PSNI and Angarda Shikana have done a huge amount of work um, in order to ensure that, as far as is possible, they will be able, under existing ar arrangements um, and future arrangements, to be able to continue to share data as far as possible. But you'll understand um, that until we have clarity about what is expected, it is very difficult to give people the reassurance that they would rightly seek on these issues. Paul, Paul Fruit. Speaker, uh, due to the Papani arrangements, which is the management of sexual offenders, there has always been concerns and blind spots when an offender travels across the border multiple times. Um, can the Minister, and nothing to do with Brexit, of course, it's just always been a concern and a problem. Can the Minister enlighten this House to the improvements that have been made over the last number of years on the management of sex offenders between two jurisdictions? I thank the member for his question. Um, as he will be aware, there was also um, last week a meeting of um, the various um, public protection um, agencies, including the Probation Board and the Probation Service. Um, and I was able and very pleased to attend that meeting um, that we had prior to my meeting with um, Minister McEntee under the IGA. The PPAG carries out its work in a very positive and progressive and professional manner, with representatives from probation, police, prisons and justice departments in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Staff training and development opportunities are being explored across the justice agencies on a cross-border basis, and currently Papanai um, related training in respect of domestic violence and sexual offenders is being progressed and developed. The annual um, PPAG seminar is now in its 11th year, so there has been considerable work done in that time. The theme for this year is Emerging Needs North-South, Developing Criminal Justice Practice, and it was hosted by colleagues in the South via virtual platform on the 27th of November, and we were both present at that event. I have to say I was very encouraged by the level of cooperation on a cross-border basis um, between all of the agencies, and I think it's absolutely crucial, as the member rightly says, um, that we're able to continue to share data, continue to share evidence, continue to share intelligence in order that we keep people safe in their communities. And I call Liz Kimmins. and leads on from, from the last member's question in relation to um, sexual violence and, and the impacts across both jurisdictions. Based on, on what you've said, Minister, would you then commit to the development of an all-island strategy in terms of tackling sexual violence, um, mainly for the, the points that have been outlined? Thank you. Well, I think close coordination and cooperation is very important. From our perspective, certainly um, in Northern Ireland um, and in the Republic, there, we are at different stages in terms of the rollout of our various um, strategies. But what we do try to do is keep pace with each other. And I certainly would have no objection if it were to bring ad added value um, to us having an additional strategy. However, I think that the working groups that have already been established under the five-strand approach um, to the IGA are, are probably more effective in that they actually drill down at operational level into what cooperation and collaboration we can, we can bring about, and also actually what learning we can take from each other. But I'm happy to talk to the member further if she believes that there are additional value um, that could be drawn from having a more coordinated approach. And I call Mark Durgan. A bit of Kionkolia, and I thank the Minister for her statement. The statement heralds the success of law enforcement agency interventions that have seen the seizure of almost €10 million Euros worth of drugs, and such seizures are obviously very welcome and reduce the amount of drugs in our communities. But in my opinion, real success should be measured in terms of the arrest and apprehension of big-time drug dealers and the dismantling of drug gangs who continue to flood our communities with dangerous drugs that are ruining lives. Does, uh, or would the Minister agree, and does the Minister know how many arrests were made in relation to these interventions? 
In relation to the numbers, I don't have those figures, but I'm happy to write to the member um, if we can obtain such figures. Um, they will obviously be held in different formats in different jurisdictions, but I will endeavour to try and get some indication. I agree entirely with the member um, that it is not enough simply to take the drugs out of the community, although that is a huge issue. It is also important to take the drug dealers out of the community and ensure that they face justice. I think that that is um, a task to which all of the partners um, in the JATF are absolutely committed. Um, I think it, part of the strategy is to disrupt criminal gangs so that they no longer can make profit um, from their, their dealing in drugs or indeed in human misery via human trafficking. However, I think that it is quite right that the member says and draws attention to the fact that it would be also very important that those responsible are brought before the courts because unfortunately um, disrupting their activity is often not sufficient to disabuse them of the interest in continuing with it. I call Martin Anderson. Goi Miagad, Ken Kolya, Gurim Buikas, Austin Righteous. Uh, Minister, thank you for, for that statement. And Minister, as you know, I would concur with your view that uh, Brexit is folly, reckless and wrong. But just picking up on your answer to uh, a previous uh, member, am I right in, con in understanding what you're saying is that by losing access to EU key justice and security cooperation arrangements, that the North is going to be left with substandard tools to tackle cross-border crime, and that we could become more susceptible to criminality at the end of this Brexit transition period, and there'll be no good Brexit whether there's a deal or no deal? Well, I think the member makes an important point, but I want to reinforce a couple of things. First and foremost, we have worked very hard with the Department of Justice, um, within the Department of Justice and with the Department for Justice in the South to ensure that wherever possible we are able to find alternative means of doing the work that we currently do, because we do not want people to feel unsafe, neither do we want to send a message um, to criminals that life will be any easier um, post the Brexit transition period than it is currently. And it is our intention and it is the intention of all of the agencies involved in cross-border cooperation that that will be the case. There will, however, um, potentially be gaps in the system if we don't have a justice and security partnership fully negotiated between the UK and the EU. Um, that, could, that could affect our access to um, certain databases of information that are held in the EU. It could affect our access to uh, some of the measures and tools that are available from within the EU, and that would then drive us back to relying on older um, conventions, um, such as the Lugano Convention from 1957. Those conventions work, so I wouldn't want people to think that they don't work, but they do take much longer. For example, an, an extradition um, under the Lugano Convention can take many, many more months than a, an extradition under a European arrest warrant. And that multiplication factor has impact both on those who are um, accused of crime and also those who are alleged victims of crime um, in terms of being able to seek justice. It also has a cost implication um, because it is much more onerous um, for us to manage. So there are genuine challenges there. If we don't get a future security partnership agreed as part of the current talks, then we fall into a situation where it would be for the UK government um, to enter into bilateral negotiations with the Irish government to try to find a way forward. We would certainly be lobbying and have been lobbying very strongly with the Home Office and others, that that should be the first priority, that the first country they should be knocking on the door of for a bilateral agreement is Ireland, because they are by far our largest customer when it comes, um, and the UK's largest customer when it comes um, to issues like extradition um, and when it comes to issues like data sharing. So it would make sense to start with Ireland and work from there rather than start elsewhere and work backwards. So we are very clear that there are a number of routes to get to where we want to be, which is good, um, co good continued cooperation. However, there are a number of obstacles to be overcome in order to get there, and it is clear to me that there is a huge amount of, of um, energy and expenditure involved in trying to get us to where we want to be. I think that is regrettable when that money could instead, and that attention could instead be focused on the job that other members have referred to of actually trying to take criminals out of business. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you. I read in this statement that the intergovernmental agreement proclaims a focus on support for victims. Does that extend to seeking truth for IRA victims who died because the Dublin government assisted in the spawning of the provisional IRA 
who die, who failed to obtain justice because the Dublin government denied extradition for decades and allowed collusion between the Garda and the Provisional IRA. Does any of that interest the Minister enough to have pressed her Dublin counterpart for truth and justice for such victims that she should represent? Well, I thank the member for his question, and no, it doesn't extend to that particular issue. It is about support for victims who are currently going through the justice system, um, who are currently involved um, in cases that are live at the moment, um, and supporting them. And of course, there will be some of those who will be legacy cases, and therefore it would extend to some of those cases. However, he asks if it interests me sufficiently that I would be willing to press my Irish counterparts on that. And the answer to that, of course, is yes, because I believe that truth and justice for all victims um, actually matters, and I believe that legacy issues need to be comprehensively dealt with. And I have stood in this place many times, and I can assure the member that wherever collusion may come from, um, whoever may be behind that collusion, wherever the information may come from, whether it requires a public inquiry or whether it requires a legacy, another form of legacy investigation, I am in favour of that happening. And I want to reassure um, the member that as leader of the party, um, but not only as leader of the party as Minister of Justice, that I recognise fully that us not being able to resolve legacy issues is having a toxic effect on our ability to deliver justice in many communities in the here and now. It is polluting our ability in terms of the new start that we have for policing and justice to be able to move forward. And so I believe it is incumbent um, on the British and Irish governments and all of the parties in this chamber to find a comprehensive way forward, whether that be the Stormont House Agreement, which is what we signed up to, or whether that be an alternative proposition that is to be put to us that we have yet to see. It is important and incumbent on all of us to find a way forward that delivers for all victims in terms of truth and justice. It cannot continue to be dealt with in a piecemeal way, in a piecemeal fashion. It is not fair on victims, and they should be at the forefront um, of our consideration in those matters. And that concludes questions on a statement. Members, please take your ease for a moment or two. Thank you.